<laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, John, what? It's Saturday night? I gotta start over, sorry, folks. Um, hello, horror writers, welcome to Pittsburgh. Now nah, I'm just playing. What's up, Halloween uh, people? Yeah, I'm sorry, John. What? How you doing tonight? It's Saturday night. Yeah. I gotta start uh, over. As sorry, Brian folks. mentioned, um, uh, I'm your MC hello, tonight, Kevin Wentmore. Hello, horror writers. AKA Welcome Mayberry, to Pittsburgh, aka K Dubs, uh, aka Mighty Screv. And in certain nah, parts of Aspen, what's up, East Halloween Christ yeah, sorry, John, Run. How you doing tonight? It's Saturday night. Don't step yeah, to horror writers. Got... We've already imagined your death a hundred times before we meet you. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to Horror Prom 2023, Enchantment Under the Monongahela. That is a terrible prom theme. And also the plot of George Romero's Land of the Dead, so good on us. Uh, I like horror prom. I think it's better than high school prom, because the people who go to high school prom are the people who peak in high school. And horror writers are like fine wine. We just get better with age, baby. Yeah? Plus, let's be honest, prom comes from the Celtic word meaning bad time. Or the Saxon word meaning our gym, but with streamers. I don't want to do that. I want to do this. I want to welcome everyone who is watching on... We, uh, we post new content on the Bram Stoker channel at least once a year. We want to thank our Patreon supporters. Everyone who is watching uh, we put, on... Uh, special stuff available only to our Patreon sponsors. Tonight is the next thing for our Patreon sponsors. Right after we, this uh, uh, we post new ceremony. content on the Bram Stoker if channel you're a Patreon at least once supporter, a year, please join us for a live stream. We want join to thank our HW Patreon supporters. And I, Everyone who is watching on uh, Special stuff Boston available video. only to our Patreon sponsors. Tonight is the next That's thing for our Patreon, Patreon supporters. Like right and subscribe. We, uh, uh, we post new content on... that joke early to see where you all were. Thank you. Um... And the reason for that is, and this is a true story, when I was a little kid, about 10 years old, I was watching Evening at the Improv, uh, which is a show that used to be on uh, A&E, which stands for Arts and Entertainment. Now it shows reruns of Sex Sent Me to the ER, but back then they used to do stuff. Uh, and it was Evening at the Improv, hosted by Vincent Price. And Vincent Price comes out and says, I'm sure you're all wondering, why is a horror guy hosting a comedy show? But horror people have a great sense of humor. For example, take my favorite joke. Two mangled corpses walk into a bar. And I heard that and thought, that's what I want to do. Horror and comedy together. I love that. And in Pittsburgh, this dream has come true. Today, thank you, yes. Today in Pittsburgh, I walked into a bar with a mangled corpse. And it was everything I hoped it would be. And it's also the reason why I'm no longer allowed in Hemingway's on Forbes. Uh, worth it. Um, I, w I would like to take a second uh, to welcome everyone. Uh, you don't, uh, we're introverts. You don't have to actually raise your hand or stand up or anything. I'm just going to ask people if this is not your first uh, Bram Stoker Awards banquet, let's welcome the people who are here for the first time. Let's welcome the new folks. Welcome. Yeah. All are welcome here. If you are in this room, you are family, thank you for coming. If this is your first time, please allow me, in the time-honored tradition of my people, to mansplain it to you. <laughs> the Bram Stoker Awards are when the horror writers of the world come together to dress like Tim Burton characters <laughs> and give statues to Lee Murray. You all think these are tonight's awards behind me. Lee just brought her previous wins. <laughs> Didn't have room in the hotel for them, so she put them up here. If I were Lee, I, I would like wait until I meet Lisa Morton or Jonathan Mayberry and be like, still a fight. <laughs> and that's why she is better than me. Um, I also want to take a second to thank uh, Michael and Ben and Sarah. Can we give some love for them, please? They throw a hell of a party, so thank you. Uh, the, the labor behind this is often invisible, and the fact that it goes so effortlessly and you don't see the fires they're putting out shows you how wonderful this event has truly been. And I believe this is the largest amount of attendees, so congratulations, y'all. That is really exciting. 
and behind them, of course, is the larger organization. So I would love to uh, ask you to thank our, our, our president, John Edward Lawson, the board, Megan, everyone else. This has been, yeah, go ahead and you can clap for them. Come on, folks, show some love for the people in charge. We've had some moments this year, and that's all I'm going to say, but, you know, they have created an, uh, a wonderfully inclusive and open organization where everyone is encouraged to feel welcome and a part and that your voice will be heard. And I think that's truly a wonderful thing. Thank you. Um, I also uh, would like to encourage us. Oh, actually, there's Brian. Hey, Brian. Can I ask a favor on behalf of Brian? I, I've noticed on social media that um, people like are asking Brian to be the godfather of HWA. Whenever things are going down, people are like, what's Brian going to do? Can we stop treating Brian like the, the, the godfather? It's like, Don Keen, Don Keen, my publisher must send me my author's copies. <laughs> you come here on the day of my book's release. <laughs> you come here to Bucca Books in Morgantown, West Virginia, where I'm doing a signing. And you bring this to me. Here's what I will do. I will speak poorly of your publisher on social media. <laughs> I will go on my podcast and say things about them and encourage my special guest, tonight Christopher Golden, to do the same. <laughs> when I see them at a con, from across the dealer room, I will give them my angry, disappointed dad face. <laughs> you will get your books. Grazie, Dunkin', grazie. If there is ever anything I can do for you, not today, I, I got the book signing, but uh, someday you will edit an anthology. <laughs> and you will say no reprints. I will send you a story I have already published and you will accept it. <laughs> Thank you. Let the man write. He's trying to finish a trilogy. Some of us are waiting for number three, please. Uh, I, I want to tell you a little bit of a personal story here, partly because that's my shtick, right? Name dropping, funny voices, heartwarming anecdote. Uh, at least that's what Sarah told me. You know, that's what you did last year. Do it again, dance monkey. Okay. <laughs> I'm excited to be in Pittsburgh because I actually lived here for several years back in the '90s, and Pittsburgh excites me because it is a city that has embraced its horror heritage. Yeah. Like, George Romero came along, and this city became zombie town. The only other place I can think of like that is Providence, Rhode Island. Right? Don't get too excited. There's a joke coming. <laughs> We're like, Lovecraft is like, I am Providence, and Providence is like, and we are Lovecraft, except the racism. Not anymore. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> but Romero has been embraced by this town. Like, you can go down to the diviest dive bar in McKee's Rocks or somewhere. You walk in and sit down, and they're like... Yun's new in town? Yeah? Sit down, we're gonna learn ya. If Yun's gonna live in Pittsburgh, Yun's gotta love tree things. He's gotta love the Stillers. Uh, for those of you not from Pittsburgh, that's the Steelers. All right? Yun's gotta love Iron City. Yun's gotta love zombies. Like, they love zombies in this town. I used to go to Mass at the Church of St. Peter and Paul in Oakland, and you'd be walking out and you'd be like, uh, great sermon, Father, and be like, hey, don't forget, we're having uh, a parish fundraiser this Friday. We're showing night, dawn, and day all together. Take uh, 10 bucks, go see Laura Jakubowski, okay? All right, uh, thank you, Father, happy Easter. Yeah, go Stillers. <laughs> this town loves its football, it loves its beer, and it loves its zombies, and that really excited me. I moved here in August of 1993 to start my PhD at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, I was moving in with my college girlfriend. It didn't work out, that's fine. This, this, this has been a problematic town for relationships for me. I also met and married my first wife here. And as the phrase first wife indicates, <laughs> it didn't work out because we wanted different things. Uh, I wanted to have children, and she wanted to bang a guy named Corey. Um, <laughs> no, it's okay, I thought it had gone out of style in the 80s. So because she wasn't into having a family and I wasn't into retro adultery, we, uh, we went our separate ways with no hard feelings. I hope she's happy with whoever she's cheating on her current husband with. Um, sorry, that was very cleansing for me. But I moved here with uh, my college girlfriend and um, the morning that I moved here, I went out and I got a copy of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Oh, uh, older writers, if you're sitting next to a younger writer, please explain what a newspaper was. And the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette said, this weekend is the 25th anniversary of Night of the Living Dead. 
And there is something being done at the Monroeville Mall called the Zombie Jamboree. And you can come meet the cast, meet George Romero, meet you know Miss September Playmate, because uh, that, that had to be a thing, and meet Dave Prose from Star Wars. I'm like, <laughs> And I found out later it's because every convention in America from the 90s through the 2000s, you were legally required to have a Star Wars cast member present. Like you could go to the Romance Writers of America and they'd be like, oh, and we have Judith Kranz and Paul Sheldon and here's Anthony Daniels, he played C-3PO. Hello. <laughs> you just had to have him. So we moved here and I see this and I go back to my girlfriend and I say, you're going to have to unpack alone. And she's like, oh, was there an orientation they didn't tell you about? And I was honest, I'm like, zombie jamboree, Monroe, Vilmo, George Romero, I have to go, yada, yada. And just to, to explain how this worked out, um, this was my college girlfriend, and for the last two years of college, my dorm room wall, one dorm room wall, was completely taken up with a subway poster of the VHS release of Dawn of the Dead. So once you have hooked up under reanimating Roger, she understands that for me this is a religious thing. So I went to the Monroeville Mall, I toured it with George Romero, got to talk with everyone, and I brought this along with me. This is from my first weekend in Pittsburgh. I bought this in high school. But my first weekend in Pittsburgh, I got it signed by the entire cast and George Romero. And that's how I started my time here in Pittsburgh. And it was very exciting for me. It's zombie town. It's really exciting. After that, uh, once I got my doctorate, I got a job. I moved to Ohio. It's okay. I got time off for good behavior. Um, and I used to sit in my office. Now, I don't mean to brag or show off. But in 1999, in my office, I had something called the internet. <laughs> Not the dial-up, I had internet, ladies. <laughs> All right. And I would sit in my office, and this is true, Google Bram Stoker Award nominees to see who had been nominated. And I would then go to the local mall and go to the Walden Books. Uh, oh, older writers, if you're sitting next to a younger writer, explain what a Walden Books is. Uh, millennial writers, if you're sitting next to a Gen Z writer, explain what bookstores were. And I would go in and I would order stuff uh, and, and get it. And that's how actually I ended up hearing about a lot of you. That was my introduction to the HWA and its members, finding out that's what first learned about Linda Addison, first learned about Al going back, began ordering these books and reading all y'all. And it was very exciting for me. This is sort of a confessional coming out kind of thing. I'm a horror writer now, thank you. Uh, you know, a journey of self-discovery. And uh, a little bit later on after I moved to Los Angeles, I would go on the internet and see what was going on. And they were like, oh, and this year we're doing the Bram Stoker Awards being hosted by Jeff Strand. And I was like, ooh, Jeff Strand, who is Jeff Strand? Who is this? And go and Google and get a picture, you know, tuxedo. And at the time, like mustache, little mullet going on. It was cool. It was the mid 2000s, he's fine. Uh, and I'm like, horror and comedy, let me learn more about the Jeff Strand, this Bram Stoker MC who's doing it for like uh, 10 times, really impressive. And if you had told me back then that I would be nominated for a Bram Stoker Award, that I would be standing where Jeff Strand once stood, metaphorically speaking, I would have looked at you and said, do you have an appointment? I know these are office hours, but uh, you're talking nonsense. Why are you here? I'm not a horror. How did you get past Maryland? Uh, I'm going to call campus security because this is getting a little weird now. And I would realize tonight that you were a prophet, that you could see the future. And I would abandon my family and follow you <laughs> and learn from you. And so I am so glad you don't exist, imaginary person, because that would really fuck with my shit. All right? So thank you for that. Uh, OK, that just got weird. So uh, let's go somewhere else. Um, one of the things that I learned to do in Pittsburgh was speak with the dead. This is true. I learned that I have psychic abilities. There's a show on TV called uh, Crossing Over with John Edwards. We remember this? And John would talk to people. And now I am here to talk to the dead. Would, would, would you like a demonstration? Would you like? OK. All right, so uh, everyone just take a deep breath and empty your heads. Oh, some of you did that very quickly. Good. <laughs> Taking advantage of that cash bar. <sighs> OK, the spirits are here. Uh, and I have messages for some of you. Is, is there an Ellen T? No, Ellen D in the room. Ellen, Ellen D, okay. Thank you. Your great, great grandmother on your father's side is no longer with us, correct? Okay. She's here and she has a message for you. She says she loves you and she misses you. Okay, I don't, I don't, understand this next part of the message, but she says you will, okay? 
She says she will be able to rest in peace if you include one of my stories in the year's best horror. <laughs> I don't know what that means, do you? Okay. I hope this message brings you peace. All right, let's talk to someone else. Um, oh, this is a message for someone watching on YouTube. Okay, uh, Jonathan N, no, Jonathan M. Maber Mayberry, Jonathan Mayberry watching on YouTube. I have a message for you. Oddly, also from Ellen's great-great-grandmother. <laughs> The dead are different, the dead are strange. She says, uh, big fan, love everything you write, has read it all, Rotten Ruin, uh, the, the, the novels, the, the Dead of Night series, the Pine Deep trilogy, absolutely loved it, watched every episode of V Wars, congratulations. But she says her heart was broken because she was not selected to be included in the Have a Character Named After You in the next Joe Ledger novel contest. <laughs> she says she will be able to rest in peace if you include her name as a character in the next Joe Ledger novel. Really? Now that is a coincidence. She says her name is Kevin Wetmore. <laughs> Did you know your grandmother was named Kevin? That's so crazy. What a coincidence. I didn't choose the gift. The gift chose me. I hope this brings you peace, Jonathan. Thank you. Okay. Is there, is there a Ryan Keene in the room? Ryan Keene? Brian Keene. The spirits say close enough. Okay. Um, now, we don't know each other, do we? We've never met, we've never spoken. I don't know who you are. Do we know each other? No. no. See, this is why I don't work with amateurs. It just, for the purposes of the bit, he just confirmed we don't know each other at all. Okay. Uh, now, you're a writer of some kind, yes? Of some kind, good. How would I know that if the spirits weren't telling me? We don't know each other. Uh, I, have, I have a message for you. Oddly, from Jonathan's great-great-grandmother. It's just getting strange tonight. Um, she's telling me that you run some kind of workshop, the Scars the Car? Scares the Care, Writer's Workshop, yes? Good. She is telling me that writers who help other writers, writers who lift other writers through their teaching, through their work, who take time out of their own writing to make writers improve and to welcome them into the community are among the best people on the planet and why this organization exists. And she says, that's one of the things that, that you do and that this organization does, that we lift each other as we climb, that this is not a competition. This is cooperation, collaboration. This is a family, and that is a beautiful thing. And she's telling me that you also have two scholarships, yes? For uh, writers from marginalized communities. And she is saying that is modeling allyhood, allyship. Ally is not a noun, it is a verb. You ally with someone, and you are putting your money where your mouth is by allying and saying, I'm going to take the time, the effort, and the money to make sure that everyone is welcome at the table, that voices are lifted and raised, and there is space for everyone to be heard. And that is an absolutely wonderful thing. And she says she can rest in peace. <laughs> Don't get ahead of me. If you add a third scholarship for Bram Stoker Award hosts, she says because Jeff Strand could use the help. Nana Mayberry, that's not nice. But seriously, he just novelized a film that came out 45 years ago. That's like George R.R. R. Martin levels of delay. So, you know, if you can help him out. All right, let's do this one more time because we're, we're getting close to our keynoter. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. Um, all of your great-great-grandmothers are here. And they said to say they are incredibly proud of you. You are doing something that they never could, unless they were a writer, in which case, they're proud that you're carrying on the family tradition. And they love you, and they miss you, and they think that what you are doing is amazing and important. And they want to share that love with you. And they can rest in peace. I don't understand this part of the message, but they say you will. They can rest in peace if you were to buy the host MC a drink at the after party, preferably rum and coke. I don't know what that means, but I hope it brings you peace. Thank you. <laughs> it's just a skill I picked up here in Pittsburgh after a lot of Iron City. Um, I'm kidding, I never drink that much when I'm this high. Uh, <laughs> the edibles are kicking in right about now, it's all good. Uh, I, I just wanna say two last things before we bring up our keynoter. Um, if I had to pick a word to describe the past four days, 
that word would be joy, which sounds odd to outsiders, you know, horror, con, horror, horror convention, joy. Yeah, actual joy. The looks on our faces when we see people that we maybe only see once a year at Stoker Con. The, the panels that come together and the excitement. We're talking about the most dark and crazy and dangerous things, and we're smiling and laughing and having fun at it. That's a wonderful thing. I have seen so much joy, and not just between people, and there are people that I only get to see at StokerCon, and uh, it's, for me, it's like horror Christmas. You know, I'm like, oh, I get to see all these things. It's wonderful, I'm gonna have the best time of my life. But also, there's a line from the Muppet movie, just go with me. There isn't a word yet for old friends who just met. For me, that word is HWA. Because you meet someone and suddenly you're like, I'm with my people here. And we just met, but we, we get it. We understand. We know. And that is a beautiful, beautiful thing. So I hope you all are having that joy, and that joy continues tonight. Speaking of which, right now, all of us who are nominees are what I like to call Schrodinger's nominees. You haven't won, you haven't lost, you're in the box with the cat. Actually, you're a horror writer. I'm assuming you're in the box with two cats. <laughs> but I'm going to ask, the, the, the challenge is, you know, we read the names of the nominees, but only the winner gets to come up and, and talk, which is as it should be. But since right now we are all still winners, I'm going to ask all the nominees to stand up so that we can see them and celebrate love. If you're a nominee, please stand up. See what I said? Joy. That's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is briefly the importance of what we do. And I'm going to share it with an anecdote uh, from my daughter Cordelia, who reminds me of nothing so much as Wednesday Adams. She's seven going on 31. Um, I was walking her home from school a, a few weeks back. Uh, and I said, what did you learn in school today? Because I'm a good father. I care. Uh, what did you do in school today? And she said, today we learned about shun. Like, like, mean girl, like, you know, uh, Becky doesn't like miraculous ladybug, turn your backs on her. No. She's like, no, T-I-O-N, shun. The letter's T-I-O-N, shun. And it's used in words like destruction, mutilation, <laughs> abomination. <laughs> this is a real story. She's seven. <laughs> and so I said, did they teach you those words? And she said proudly, no. I taught them those words. Okay. I'm glad you're happy. I was expecting a call from the teacher again. And so I said, where did you learn those words? Because I'm figuring my fingerprints are all over this train wreck. You know, dad's a horror writer, here we go. And she looks at me like I'm an idiot and goes, goosebumps, duh. Yeah. She has an extensive vocabulary, albeit a scary one, from Goosebumps at age seven. What we do as writers is important. There are other things that she doesn't read, but she loves Goosebumps. She's learning vocabulary, she's learning concepts. Granted, the concepts are like run away from the guy in the mask, but that's a good life skill. <laughs> she's learning. When kids read our books, they learn, they grow, and sometimes horror, sci-fi, fantasy, those are the only things that they'll pick up. They hate what they're getting in school, but they read what you write, and it changes their lives. One of the things that writers can do is teach people how to see the world a different way. In fact, one of my best teachers told me that writing becomes a conversation with the dead. One, because you're shaped by all the people who came before you, but also after we're gone, our words live on and people will continue to read them and learn from them and take away from them. That is important, and that is why we live in very dark times now, because people, not naming names here, Florida, are scared of what we do, and that is because they recognize power when they see it. We can remake reality. We can change a person's worldview. I don't need a chainsaw to do that. It helps. But what we do is show people ways that could be, ways that are. We open them up to experiences and perspectives different from theirs, and that makes them more empathetic, more understanding. They stand with the survivors, they stand with the oppressed, they stand with the people who are the protagonists. 
No one watches Friday the 13th going, man, I really hope Jason does well this time, <laughs> right? And that's what I love about what we do, and that is why I think it is important. What we do changes reality. We are the Halloween people, trick or treat. Thank you, you Swifties are really cool. Um, <laughs> horror writers are really cool, thank you. Uh, it is my great honor and joy to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, and again, since I've been doing personal anecdotes all night, let me share one last one with you. Uh, when I first joined the HWA back during the Lincoln administration, um, <clears throat> I, I was in Los Angeles, I had all kinds of questions, and uh, I, I emailed Rocky Wood, who was the president at the time, and he's like, well, someone lives close to you, talk to Lisa, and uh, she'll take care of you, and she did. And I reached out to Lisa many, many times, and then, uh, sadly, after we lost Rocky, she took over as the president, uh, and greatly expanded the organization, oversaw the first StokerCon and the second StokerCon, uh, and has been a remarkable, remarkable leader in this organization. But she's not just keynoting because of her leadership skills. We are bringing her here because she is a phenomenal writer of both fiction and nonfiction. A generous mentor, a kind soul, and her nonfiction sometimes scares me more than her fiction. Uh, she is the queen of Halloween. She is our queen. Please welcome to the stage, Lisa Morton. Spirits and trick-or-treat, I see what you did there. Good evening, horror family. I'm going to start this by asking for your indulgence because I am about to do something tonight that I rarely do in public. I'm going to brag a little. I am going to brag because as I look around and see some of the best writers in any genre gathered together in a city whose uni where the university holds possibly the world's most important horror archive, I am very proud of my part in creating this thing called StokerCon. It all started about 10 years back when I was serving the HWA as vice president under a remarkable president named Rocky Wood. At that time, HWA had never held a gathering bigger than a two-day event centered around the presentation of these awards. Usually the awards dinner was held in conjunction with an existing horror convention. But under Rocky's guidance, HWA had started to grow, and our members were coming to us and saying, why don't we have our own convention? So Rocky and I started to talk about it, and we had a dream of horror writers coming together the way science fiction and romance and mystery writers had for decades, to share craft and business, and to interact directly with the other side of the writing equation, the audience. We had these wacky notions of emphasizing education and networking and camaraderie, of genuinely helping other horror writers. We decided on the name StokerCon to both honor one of the genre's legends and our own awards. We talked to people who wanted to work on it we knew we wanted to go big for that first one, so we signed a deal with a hotel in Las Vegas. And let me tell you, that wasn't easy. It took a year just to pin down the venue, and we signed that deal two years in advance. Sadly, Rocky succumbed to ALS in December of 2014, and so he wasn't there in 2016 to see how our dream played out. That first StokerCon did indeed take place in 2016 at the Flamengo Hotel in Las Vegas. And to call that a learning experience would be the understatement of the century. Even though HWA had run Bram Stoker Award Weekends and World Horror Conventions, 
this Stoker Khan was a whole new monster. I will confess right here now that it nearly broke HWA and there were a lot of discussions about scaling it back or even stopping it altogether. But I was president then and although I suffered from a whopping helping of guilt <laughs> over the amount of money that that first convention cost us, I wasn't willing to give up on what I saw as an important part of HWA's mission. Uh, so we learned, we refined, we grew. A year later, StokerCon was held on the legendary Queen Mary and incorporated the essential components that make it work. That year, Becky Spratford organized Librarian's Day. Michelle Brittany and Nicholas Dioc put together the Anne, Radcl Anne Radcliffe Academic Conference. And Jonathan Leese produced the final frame short horror film competition. And best of all, we did not lose a boatload of money. There were more things happening in 2017, though, than just StokerCon. That year, the Me Too movement went viral, continuing seismic cultural shifts that had started several years earlier. When I assumed the presidency after Rocky's passing at the end of 2014, I almost immediately found myself sitting atop controversies and conflicts birthed out of these massive changes. I will be the first to admit that I made some mistakes as I tried to steer HWA through these challenges, but they were necessary challenges, and the mistakes led to some great things, like increased awareness of women whore writers and LGBTQ plus whore writers and whore writers of color and disabled whore writers. And if that sounds like a lot of use of the H word, that is deliberate because I like to believe that we have finally moved beyond having to hide behind labels like dark fantasy and occult fiction and supernatural thriller. We are all horror writers and we... <laughs> We should all proudly claim our identity as horror writers. Now, although I don't belong to any of the other groups in any way except Ally, I can tell you that as a woman writer of horror, things hadn't always been so out of the shadows. When I started writing horror in the early 1990s, you could count on your fingers how many women writers were in the genre. Names like Elizabeth Massey were rare. It wasn't at all unusual to open a new anthology or magazine and say two or one or zero female names in those table of contents. A lot of us just didn't even submit to certain markets because we just assumed that they were not at all interested in what we were writing. Content was a problem too. It was not at all uncommon to open a new horror book and be offered a sexual assault right in the first chapter. In fact, it was so common that I suggested a few times that it was one of the genre's most overused cliches. It was also slow to change. In 2010, I did a blog entry, which you can still find in that great pixel graveyard known as Live Journal, in which I surveyed the six major small horror presses at the time. And I came up with the astounding fact that exactly 7.07% of their writers were women. I also don't mind telling you that certain male authors wrote me private messages in response to that post insisting that I take it down. My response to that was to initiate private conversations with certain small presses about including more women in their rosters.
I am very pleased to say that 13 years later, things are much better, but we still have a long way to go. Remember those mistakes I mentioned making when I became HWA's president in 2015? Well, here is why no one should ever regret mistakes that they have made, because as soon as you've realized that you blew it, it means that you have learned. And once you have learned, you have a chance to fix things. Those mistakes eight years ago led to things like HWA's Diverse Works Inclusion Committee and the monthly newsletter column, The Sears Table. They led to new HWA scholarships and blog series and our anthology, Other Terrors, and commitments to making all of HWA's members feel like our events are safe and welcoming spaces for all. But we are still not completely there yet. We're still making some mistakes. We're still learning, and we're still working to improve. There are questions that I struggle with, and I know I am not alone. How do we protect ourselves and our friends from examples of hate in a society that seems increasingly too celebrated? Is it possible to educate those who express racism or misogyny or homophobia or transphobia or ableism? And should we even try? How do we balance condemning behavior and beliefs expressed by writers in their personal lives with acknowledging the importance of the work that they have produced? Where does forgiveness and a belief in someone's capacity for change fit into all of this? In an age when the internet makes sure we can never forget, can we ever forgive? If we remove from compassion, from judgment, then what do we become? We are the creators who best understand monsters and the darkness that lurks in the human soul, but are we willing to stop and ask ourselves if we not, might not have become the monsters a little bit? These are questions I can't answer yet, and I will keep working on them because that's how we get better. I do know that we can never forget or bury our past because then we deny ourselves the ability to move forward, and I believe that we must always keep striving to move forward. This year's gathering is happening in a city where there are some everyday heroes attempting to create the world's largest horror archive a mission which I think is tremendously important. <laughs> tremendously important given that our world seems increasingly intent on erasing parts of its history that it finds uncomfortable. Archives like this protect our future by first protecting our past. Horror is an art form that is ideally situated to point out our fears and our flaws, which is one of the reasons that I have always loved the genre and always will. It's been tremendously gratifying for me and exciting to watch the genre evolve over the last 30 years. And I, for one, cannot wait to see where StokerCon and HWA and horror fiction go in the future. I believe that as horror writers, our voices will only become louder and harder to ignore as we move into that same future that we have been warning everyone about for decades and that we know how to fight. We are the ones who always stared into the darkness and forced it to serve us, but we also know that we must never serve it. Now, Let's get back to celebrating who we are and what we do. Thank you, and in the immortal words of George Romero, stay scared. Lisa, your name tag got all the way to that speech, <laughs> and now it's up here. Um, we're going to give out some awards now, yeah? 
But first, I do want to thank one more group of people. There are a large number of folks uh, from the verifiers and the people who sell, help set up here involved in getting to this moment. So I, I would like to thank Brian Matthews, uh, his wife Sue, Jim Chambers, Leela Denning, and everyone who is involved in getting us to this point. There's a lot of, again, invisible work to get to where we hand this to someone. So thank you, everyone. Brian, Jim, Sue, thank you. And because uh, we are dealing with eight-point font here, I've got to get my glasses out. The first Bram Stoker Award to be given out tonight is the uh, Superior Achievement in Short Nonfiction, Lisa Kroger and Tim Wagoner coming to the stage. So when I got the email that asked if I would like to present this award, I could have swore it said short fiction. So I had a thing about how important short fiction is, so let me kind of just, <laughs> just fix it real quick. Many people believe that short horror nonfiction is the most perfect form for horror <laughs> nonfiction um, because of the, the focus and compression and nonfictionness. So, it's our privilege to be here tonight to go ahead and present this award. Do you want to alternate the names? Sure. Okay, go first. All right, the nominees for Superior Achievement in Short Nonfiction are Lee Murray, I Don't Read Horror, and Other Weird Tales, Interstellar Flight Magazine, Interstellar Flight Press. Cynthia Paleo, This Is Not a Poem, Writing Poetry in the Dark, Raw Dog Screaming Press. Kevin J. Wetmore, Jr., A Clown in the Living Room, The Sinister Clown on Television, The Many Lives of Scary Clowns, Essays on Pennywise, Twisty, The Joker, Krusty and More, McFarland and Company. L. Marie Wood, African American horror authors and their craft, the evolution of horror fiction from African folklore. Conjuring Worlds, an Afrofuturist textbook for middle and high school students. Conjure World. And L. Marie Wood, The H Word, The Horror of Hair, Nightmare Magazine, number 118, Adamant Press. And the Bram Stoker Award goes to? This is so much fun. <laughs> Lee Murray, I Don't Read Horror and Other Weird Tales, Interstellar Flight Magazine, Interstellar Flight Press. told me I had to write a speech this year, so I must have really sucked last year. <laughs> so I did. Oh no, this is, no it's not, it's okay. I thought it might have been Dave Jeffries. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. I'm just, I can't believe this. It is really something to win this amazing award with an essay that compares a literary genre to Brussels sprouts. I did think it really says something about the horror genre and this community that we are able to write what we love. And if what you love happens to be ghosts or chainsaws or Brussels sprouts, we try not to pull a face and hold it against you. So thank you to all my friends and colleagues who supported this little essay, to those of you who reached out to me to tell me how much the work resonated to my beta readers, Grace Bridges and Celine Murray, and to my editor, Holly Wildrath, at Interstellar, 
Stella Flight magazine who gave the essay a home and paid for it. <laughs> and to the Stoker Committee and jurors for all their hard work behind the scenes. Um, and to my darling David Murray, who does not like Brussels sprouts and doesn't read horror, um, but who indulges me anyway. And mostly, I want to thank my fellow nominees for sharing their fantastic words and making me proud to be among them. Our, our horror prom king over here, Mr. Kevin Wetmore, for scrubbing away the makeup on scary clowns. His work is on the ballot every year, and he's consistently good. The indomitable Elmarie Wood, overachiever. <laughs> who has not one but two essays on this ballot on African-American um, horror folklore and the horror of hair. I love that essay so much. And finally, guest of honor, uh, Sine Paleo, for her beautiful es essay, Ceci n'est pas un poème, in Stephanie Wytovich's writing poetry in the dark. And while I'm standing here and I get to take the little castle home, yeah. <laughs> um, but I know you'll all agree that they're all winners. So um, please, can we have some applause for them? Thank you all so much. And congratulations, Lee. The prophecy came true. <laughs> Gonna have a stoker fight later. Next up is Superior Achievement in a Graphic Novel. Clay McLeod Chapman and Ryan Keen, sorry, Brian Keen are coming to the stage. Gentlemen. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Clay McLeod Chapman and I am the writer of such comics as X-Men, uh, I've written for Spider-Man, uh, written for Iron Fist. And I'm Ryan, excuse me, Brian Keane, you got me doing it now. I've written for Thor, Batman, Superman, Doom Patrol, Masters of the Universe, Harley Quinn, uh, and a bunch more. But what does that actually mean? I can Brian? tell you what, I can use math. Raise your hand if you're a writer, but you've never written a comic book. Just a quick raise of hands. Each and every one of you has made more money and been treated more fairly than playing. <laughs> and on that note, the nominees for Superior Achievement in a Graphic Novel are... James Aquilone, editor Kolchak the Night Stalker, 50th anniversary from Moonstone Books. Sarah Gailey and Pius Bach, Eat the Rich, from Boom Studios. <laughs> Alessandro Manzetti and Stefano Cardoselli for Kraken Inferno, The Last Hunt, Independent Legions Publishing. <laughs> James Tinian IV and Werther de Leidra, the artist, and it is for Something is Killing the Children, volume four, from Boom Studios. And Scotty Young, author, and Jorge Corona, artist, the me you love in the dark, from Image Comics. And the Bram Stoker Award goes to... James Aquilone, Kolchak, the Night Stalker, 50th anniversary. So this was such a dream product to work on, not only that I get to do a cold check story, but I got to work with some of the best people in the business. So I have to thank all the amazing writers in this book, 
David Abalone, Jonathan Mayberry, Peter David, R.C. Matheson, Kim Newman, Gabriel Hardman, Steve Niles, Rodney Barnes, Tim Wagner, Nancy A. Collins, and James Chambers. I'd also like to thank Lisa Morton and Al Going Back, who had amazing pro stories in the deluxe edition. Uh, and I have to thank Moonstone, the Jeff Rice estate, and my wife, who is the, the true horror fan in the family. And I'm going to like to thank the HWA and everyone who voted. Thank you. I'm beginning to regret comparing Ryan Keene to The Godfather. Um, I think he might try to shoot me and take the cannoli, and I don't even have a cannoli. So I'm gonna have to find an all-night bakery here on the south side while you're all at the reception. Um, except, of course, for those of you who are watching Petraean supporters, we'll see you at the Evans City Cemetery. Uh, coming up next, Superior Achievement in a Poetry Collection, uh, Geneve Flynn and Maxwell Ian Gold. Okay, as someone who has only recently discovered the joy of writing and reading poetry, I'm honored to be presenting this award with Maxwell Ian Gold. Poetry can capture a moment, a feeling, a thought. With only a few words, a skilled poet can slice to the very heart of you, expose a nerve and make it sing. The finalists for tonight's award have each demonstrated just how steady and sharp their knives are. and We congratulate them from cutting, for cutting us to the bone. This text is much bigger than what I have on the program. <laughs> the nominees for Superior Achievement in a Poetry Collection are... Michael Bailey and Marge Simon, Sifting the Ashes, Crystal Lake Publishing. <laughs> Donna Lynch, Girls from the Country, Raw Dog Screaming Press. Cynthia Peleo, Crime Scene, Raw Dog Screaming Press. Sumiko Salson, The Rat King, A Book of Dark Poetry from Dookie Zines. Christina Singh, The Gravity of Existence, Interstellar Flight Press. And the Bram Stoker Award goes to. Wow, this is hard. Let's <laughs> <laughs> take together. Yes. Cynthia Paleo, Christ. WA, thank you to the board, thank you to the voting members, thank you Stephanie Whitesovich. You read my poetry in 2010, 2011, and nobody believed in me but you. And I'm here because of you, and you, kept, you believed in me, and I'm so lucky that I've worked with you on several projects, and I'm in awe of you and you're brilliant, and I'm also glad to call you my friend. Thank you to John Lawson and Jennifer Barnes. I'm grateful for your kindness. 
and for believing in me. Thank you to my agent, Lane Haymont. Where is she? Where is Haley Piper? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you. You need good friends. And I love Haley Piper so much because you're not just a writing colleague, but you are my rock in this industry. So thank you so much. I love you. Thank you to Sarah Tatlinger. I am inspired by you. I am honored that you provided the introduction for this. You're an inspiration to me. Thank you to Brian Keane and Gabino Iglesias, because when I wanted to quit, you told me not to. You told me to keep going, and I'm grateful for you. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank you to my husband, Gerardo. You've sacrificed a lot for me to get here, and I am the first Puerto Rican Bram Stoker Award winner. And I don't know if there are many Puerto Ricans in the audience, but I just want to say, Que bonita bandera, que bonita bandera, que bonita bandera, la bandera puertorriqueña. Thank you. Coming up next, Vice President Megan R. Curry will be presenting the Specialty Press Award. Good evening. The HWA Specialty Press Award is presented periodically to a specialty publisher whose work has substantially contributed to the horror genre, whose publications display general excellence, and whose dealings with writers have been fair and exemplary. The award was instituted in 1997, largely due to the efforts of longtime HWA member and specialty press aficionado, Peter Crother. The specialty press award this year will go to Undertow Publications, headed by Michael Kelly. Kelly. Unfortunately, Michael couldn't join us tonight, so on behalf of him, Chris um, Krawcheck is accepting. Please welcome Chris, thank you. <laughs> I'm not Michael Kelly. Uh, <laughs> Just imagine a uh, taller, much more dapper man. Um, I've had the pleasure to deal with Michael Kelly as a bookseller, and I can say in all of the ways one would hope from a small press, he conducts himself with honor and a warmth that I look up to every day. But I do have his speech. Undertow Publications is extremely grateful to be receiving the HWA Specialty Press Award to be honored and recognized by our peers in this way is truly unexpected. We are pleased beyond words. The warmth and support from the horror community has been overwhelming. We are indebted to you all. The world is full of magic and wonder and terror, and horror's canvas is broad, diverse, and welcoming. Horror is transformative. It's vibrant and important. Everyone here today, everyone watching or listening, everyone creating stories, art, films, everyone supporting artists, Every single one of you is important, everyone. We are thankful for all of you and all you do. So shine on you crazy diamonds, peace and love from Michael and the Undertow team. Thank you.
Coming up next is the Superior Achievement in Nonfiction. Coming to the stage, Lisa Morton and Benjamin Rubin. So yes, superior achievement in nonfiction. This is a uh, category that really underlines that horror is an important genre that is worthy of study, that it does require research, academic rigor, uh, and then to take all that and transform it into a work that can be accessible, informative, and uh, there's another term that I can't think of now because I'm a little nervous, so I'm just gonna stop there. Creative. Yes, yes. thank you. <laughs> So the nominees for Superior Achievement in Nonfiction are? Yeah. Michael Sisko, Weird Fiction, A Genre Study, Palgrave Macmillan. Uh, Leanna Renee Heber, A Haunted History of Invisible Women, True Stories of America's Ghosts, Citadel Press. Uh, Lisa Kroger and Melanie R. Anderson, Toil and Trouble, A Women's History of the Occult, Quirk Books. Uh, Tim Wagoner, Writing in the Dark, The Workbook, Guide Dog Books. I apologize, we left one name off on Andrea Jane should also be included in A Haunted History of Invisible Women, True Stories of America's Ghost Citadel Press. <laughs> Our final nominee is Stephanie M. Whitovich, writing poetry in the dark, Raw Dog Screaming Press. This is fun because this seriously is the first time I've ever gotten to open one of these without knowing what was inside. So, all right, and so the Bram Stoker for Superior Achievement in Nonfiction is... Tim, Tim Wagner, Wagner, Writing, writing in, in the Dark, dark The Workbook. <laughs> So because I am old, I need these. So this is my Stoker acceptance speech in case I win. <laughs> so thanks to everyone who voted for the workbook, to Jennifer Barnes and John Edward Lawson for taking a chance on a second writing in the dark, dark volume and supporting it so strongly, to D. Harlan Wilson for formatting the workbook was a real challenge with all the exercises and the weird tabs and indents. I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, and to my agent, Cherry Weiner. Uh, my tireless navigator through the rough waters of publishing, to all the writers who contributed writing exercises and advice, to my wife, Christine Avery, who I'm hoping is watching this at home, but you never know with our internet. It's not always being the spouse of a writer, and I couldn't do what I do without her love and support. Uh, thanks to me for forsaking my vow to never write another book about writing horror. <laughs> and most especially, thanks to everyone who read the first writing in the dark book and said how useful they found the exercises and that they wished they had even more of them. You're the reason this workbook exists. Thank you so much. Lisa tried to steal my script and then we'd be done giving out awards, so. <sighs> okay, uh, coming up next is the Mentor of the Year Award, uh, J.G. Faraday presenting. Come on up, Greg. There is a long-standing tradition where the head of the mentor program uh, chooses the mentor of the year. This year, my choice was pretty easy. 
Dave Jeffrey. Dave epitomizes what a mentor should be. He's available, he's helpful, he's knowledgeable, and most of all, he's pleasant to work with. His mentors consistently have nothing but great things to say about him, and he also helps out the HWA in many other ways, including chairing the Wellness Committee. It is my honor to present Dave Jeffrey with the Mentor of the Year Award. And accepting on his behalf, because he's in the UK, Lee Murray. Yes, and I agree with everything Greg said. He's fantastic to work with, and he is just the epitome of the perfect mentor. So um, I promised Dave that I would do, a, do this in a British accent. <laughs> but I can kind of mangle even English with this Kiwi accent, so I'm, I'm just going to do the best I can, Dave. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, Dave writes, Firstly, can I take this opportunity to thank Lee for accepting this award on my behalf and send well wishes to all the StokerCon, all at StokerCon, and hope you're having a great time. <laughs> thank you, HWA, for this award. To be given recognition for doing something that you love is a humbling affair made even more so when you think of the incredible people who have received the HWA Mentor of the Year Award since its inception in 2016. One of the selling points for becoming a mentor is to give something back. But as any mentor will tell you, it's so much more. It's a creative journey, working closely with mentees who are entrusting you with the task of helping them see their work in a different way, and in doing so, create something meaningful and worthwhile. I have been incredibly lucky to work with some wonderful people over the past few years, so thank you to my mentees, Rosemary Thorne, Gerald Mood, and Zachary Finn, three talented writers who are publishing stories in small presses as we speak. Massive thanks to go to Greg Faherty for the incredible work he does in coordinating the mentorship program and for nominating me for this year's award. And of course, a huge thank you to my wife, Justine, for her patience and understanding as to why I need to do Zoom feedback meetings in the early hours of the morning or late at night. And to Tom and Grace for just being awesome kids. Thank you. Congratulations, Dave. Here it is, Dave. <laughs> Coming up next is the superior achievement in a young adult novel, Daniel Krauss and Elizabeth Massey. I regret to say we did all our bantering outside. Oh, how we bantered. <laughs> but that's all over now. <laughs> I just want to say that when I was a young adult, they, we didn't have the amazing works that, were, that, that are available now for young adults. I would have loved to have had these books and this amazing talent that just pours from these writers. I would have loved to have had that. Um, and so thank you guys who write for young adults because these, I hate to say teenagers because they're, well, they are teenagers, right? Is that okay? Um, <laughs> they are so lucky to have these works to read and to, to be inspired by and to, to be terrified by and good for you guys, yay. <laughs> All right, so the nominees for Superior Achievement in a Young Adult Novel are Anne Fristat, What We Harvest, Delacorte Press. <laughs> Tiffany D. Jackson, The Weight of Blood, Catherine Teagan Books. K. 
Kate Alice Marshall, These Fleeting Shadows Viking. Robert P. Atone, The Triangle, Raven Tales Publishing. V. E. Schwab, Gallant Green Willow Books. And Vincent Torado, Burn Down, Rise Up, Source Book Fire. I'll let you. And the Bram Stoker Award goes to. Am I reading? Yes, you are. Robert Piatone, The Triangle, <laughs> Raven Tale Publisher. Brian Matthews told me to write something and I didn't. <laughs> I'm just so happy to be nominated with such great people and pushing our little segment forward of the genre, young adult. Oh, God. I'm sorry. Um, I want to thank my wife. She's not here. She might be watching. I don't know. Uh, she might be. Uh, <laughs> I love you if you are. I want to thank my mom. She's definitely not watching. She doesn't know how to use YouTube. <laughs> <sighs> this is crazy. Um, I want to thank all the people who inspire me. And I want to thank everybody who's been so welcoming in the HWA and supportive. It really has meant the world to me. And you know who you are. It's all of you here. And uh, I, I wish my dad was here too to see this. And this is for him. Coming up next is Superior Achievement in a Middle Grade Novel. Uh, presented by Becky Spratford and Conrad Stump. Hello. Um, I'm introducing to a lot of you Conrad, but Conrad and I are your HWA Library Committee. Yes. <laughs> The library committee exists to connect libraries with horror authors and publishers and to connect horror authors and publishers with libraries to promote horror as much as humanly possible. <laughs> and, thank you. One of the things we do is also the Summer Scares Reading Program, which is the reason we are up here tonight. Because the Summer Scares Reading Program made this middle grade award happen. And we just want to take a moment to acknowledge that these nominees will forever and always be the first ever nominees in this category. And here we go. The nominees for Superior Achievement in a Middle Grade Novel are... Delilah S. Dawson, Camp Scare, Delacorte Press. Daniel Krause, They Stole Our Hearts, Henry Holt and Company. Ali Malaninko, The Appearing House, Catherine Teagan Books. <laughs> Laura Sneff, The Clackety, and Athlean Books for Young Readers. <laughs> 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 
Lisa Stringfellow, A Comb of Wishes, Quill Tree Books. Okay, and the first ever of this in middle grade Bram Stoker Award goes to. Oh my gosh! Yes, Daniel, <laughs> Daniel Krauss. Krauss. They stole our hearts. I just sat down. Um, I was just thinking that the uh, only other award show I've ever been to is the Oscars, and uh, I made a real mess of that. Uh, I um, thought you could walk to the Oscars. Turns out you can't walk to the Oscars. You have to drive, and so that was a disaster. And then the night before, I had been at the in my tux, like an idiot, at the La Brea Tar Pits. And so when I was walking up the uh, stairs, at the whatever the Oscar place is. Uh, what's her face? Uh, Margot Robbie was right in front of me. And my foot touched the back of her dress. And the La Brea tar pitch tar stuck on her. Listen, it was a mess. So <laughs> this is going way better. Uh, so, uh, you know, just, just thanks. Coming up next is Superior Achievement in a First Novel, Michael Arnzen and Haley Piper presenting. Um, the Superior Achievement in a First Novel Award honors authors who burst onto the novel scene making a bold statement. And that describes every one of these nominees. Totally, and uh, it's a first novel award, which means we love what you're doing, and we want to see a second one. <laughs> <laughs> the nominees are Aaron E. Adams, Jackal, Bantam Books. <laughs> Isabel Cañas, The Hacienda, Berkeley. Casey Jones, Black Tide, Tour Nightfire. Christy Nogle, Beulah, Cemetery Gates Media. <laughs> Ali Wilkes, All the White Spaces, Emily Bessler Books, Atria, Titan Books. And the award goes to. It wasn't so hard. <laughs> Christy Nogle, Pula, Center, Gates Media. Like everyone else, uh, Brian asked me to write something, <laughs> and I did. <laughs> um, so I wrote, uh, if I'm reading this, there's been some kind of glitch or a disruption in the timeline. <laughs> I feel so surreal, but I can't believe I'm reading this. Um, Beulah is dedicated to my mother. She um, read the manuscript after Cemetery Gates Media accepted the novel for publication but she didn't live uh, to see the cover reveal or any of the responses. Um, I think if she had, she would be as grateful to all of you and as overwhelmed, absolutely overwhelmed as I am. Um, so I wanna thank her and my partner, Jim, first and foremost. I wanna thank um, Alex and Pseudopod for accepting my very first horror story that I ever wrote. 
Um, Cemetery Gates, uh, my HWA mentor, John Polisano, readers, reviewers, writing groups, and especially um, John Paget and Jen McCarthy for um, blurbing this book and just much love to you all. <laughs> Brian Matthews has just asked me to remind all of you, if you ever even publish a book, write a speech just in case. <laughs> Come on, people. Next up to present the Silver Hammer Award, John Palisano. All right. It is so good to be here tonight. Look at all of you. Wow. Unbelievable, unbelievable. And uh, this is about the volunteers. I wanna thank all of our many, many volunteers. Let's give them a big round of applause. Uh, and tonight we're, we're gonna talk about volunteer number one, Karen Lansdale. All right, yeah, all right. It's the HWA gives a Silver Hammer Award to an HWA volunteer who has done a truly massive amount of work for the organization, often unsung and behind the scenes. It was instituted in 1996 and is decided by a vote of HWA's Board of Trustees. The award is so named because it represents the careful, steady, continuous work of building HWA's house. <laughs> the many institutional systems that keep the organization functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. The HWA is delighted to announce the immediate renaming of the Silver Hammer Award to Karen Lansdale Silver Hammer Award in honor of the tremendous amount of work Karen did starting the HWA. This information will now be a part of HWA's permanent archives. Yeah. Mm, mm. Our, <laughs> our physical award has also been updated. Instead of a real hammer, a new stylized sculpture has been designed that also looks like a hammer. And also will probably not get you okay on TSA, but anyway. And it has been designed and cast by the same company that mints our Bram Stoker Awards. Befitting. And tonight, Karen Lansdale will be the first recipient of the renamed award. Man. Okay. On our site, Joe R. Lansdale wrote about it, how the Horror Writers Association came to be. You have to read it, it is essential reading. Robert McCammon wrote, Karen Lansdale performed an invaluable service for the HWA at the organization's birth. And every HWA member around the world should be appreciative of the great work she did. And I'm delighted to bring to the stage his own self, Joe R. Lansdale. First thing I'm gonna say is none of you would be here tonight if it weren't for Karen Lansdale. You're here because of her. Sadly, that's not as well known as it ought to be. And uh, I remember the very beginnings. So I was here early, and in some ways, Karen was here earlier, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. I won't keep you too long, but I did want to say some things about her. And let me tell you, it's hard for me to do it tonight. My wife is suffering with Alzheimer's and has been for about the last four years. She knew enough to know that she was getting the award. And she was very excited, very happy. And when I show it to her, she'll know what it is, but five minutes later, she won't. So I can show it to her a lot. <laughs> and I will. Let me, let me, thank you.
Tell you something, I've been a martial artist for 61 years, 61. I've been thrown, I've been hit, I've been broken, I've been scarred, and nothing that's ever done to me hurts like it hurts to see the love of my life going through this. And I'm a tough guy, but tonight I'm not. I don't feel that tough. The way this started was we were in an elevator at a World Fantasy Convention. And there was Robert McCammon and his then wife, Sally, standing in front of us. And he said, he heard uh, Karen and I talk, and he said, well, I know that voice. That's a Southern voice. And I bet that's Joe and Karen Lansdale. It was. <laughs> and by the time the elevator landed, he said, you know, I've got this idea, but I just don't want to do it. It takes too much work. And he said, I thought the horror occult writers league, what a cool, cool thing to have. And he said, but it's not going to happen. I'm not going to do it. Karen said, I'll do it. Just like that. I thought she must be high. What is, <laughs> what is she doing? But she did, she took it over then, in that moment in time. And what she did, she took it home and started getting names, right? And everybody that was interested in horror, because used to, there was no horror convention, there was a world fantasy convention, and those of us who wrote all of that, I always wrote everything, but there was a little horror contingency, and they would show up at the world fantasy convention, which was that, at that time was a really huge convention. But we'd all get together and, you know, kind of hover around a bunch of couches and talk about all the stuff we loved. And there were people there like Robert Block, you know, and uh, just all the names that you can imagine in horror fiction. But they were at the World Fantasy Convention. So when Karen started taking these names, she was, you know, Richard Lehman, all of us getting all our names, she started making this list. And then she, when she got home, she worked hours on this and she had a full-time job you know I we were all working but she would come home and say what is all this shit on the couch <laughs> and and it was all of these papers and all of these names that she was collating and and writing down and then she said I need you to write an article what you're putting me to work I've already got I'm, I'm writing already no no I, I need you to write an article I need uh, so-and-so to write an article ask them I'd ask them and a lot of people contributed. A lot of people really stepped up. But they didn't know there were any steps until she was there. And then she put all this together. And she collated all that stuff. And they were very cheap little things. I mean, there weren't, they were Xeroxed. They were ugly, but people were excited. And they loved it. And she did this for a long time until she had this put together. And then... Uh, Dean Koontz said, you know what, I'll put some money into it and make it a more professional newsletter. So she gave him what we had, and he went and took it from there. So, you know, what happened, though, is at that point on, Karen got lost because she's not a braggart. She's not somebody, you know, like me, just by the way, I've got 10 of these, but I'm not, who's counting, right? <laughs> but... Uh, but, uh, you know, she's, she's not somebody that would step up for herself like that. And uh, so a lot of guys I know who did contribute suddenly seem to have been the guys who invented the Horror Writers Association, and it pissed me off. And uh, so I kept telling anybody, you know, that's not true. I mean, we were there, you know, I, and the, Rick McCammon had the name, How, which, by the way, I'm going to be honest with you, I still prefer the Horror Writers Occult League. So. <laughs> But Karen was always kind of a pioneer in a way, and a lot of people don't know this about her because she was so modest. But in our town of Nacogdoches, back, way back, in the uh, 70s, early 80s, she, went to, she had a degree in criminology. And so she went to work, she did, uh, I guess you call campus cop, which is really, you know, he is, he parked too long. Out right there. Next time I come back, I cut slash your tires. But anyway, she did that, and then she was a dispatcher there. But then she moved to the fire department. I went and tried to get a job at the fire department. They said, we don't hire women. For what do you mean? For a dispatcher? No, we can't have women up here because they have to spend the night. And she said, you know, what am I going to do? Sleep with one of the guys? I got her bed. I got her room. All the whole thing. But she was the most qualified candidate. She so broke that mold, and then she was there after 10 years. They did not want her to leave. And that's just one of many, many, many things that she did. I know that I would never, I wouldn't be here tonight 
had it, it was not for her, at least not as a writer. When we worked in the rose fields together, because that's what we did, you know, we worked in the hot sun, we worked, we hauled hay, we picked beans, uh, all that sort of stuff. She finally got a job in a um, meat truck where she had to wear like a little freezer outfit. And so she would carry in lunch meat in and out of that. And I'm working in rose fields. And then it came such bad weather that they said, look, I think we're not going to have any work for about a month or more. So I remember she said to me, she said, look, I'm really tired of hearing all this shit about how you want to write fiction. You've sold some nonfiction, but you want to write fiction. Here's your chance. I've got this job. I'm giving you three months. And when I leave here, you're going to sit down and write. And when I come home, there better be something written. <laughs> and I will tell you, I'm afraid of that woman. Yeah. <laughs> I always have been. But if it hadn't been for her, I know that I wouldn't have done that. And had it not been for that moment when she did that, it wouldn't have led to that moment when she put together the HWA. So don't forget her. Yeah, thank you. Up next is Superior Achievement in a Screenplay. Uh, Jonathan Lees and I don't think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jamie Flanagan could not make it tonight, so we have Jamal Hodges who will be reading, who will be presenting. Thank you. Sorry. Hi, everyone. I thought I would never, ever, ever do this. <laughs> this is yours. Okay. Um, I do want to say that I hope this award always goes to a human. <laughs> How do you want to bounce this up? You do one, I'll do one. OK, cool. The nominees for Superior Achievement in a Screenplay are Scott Cooper, The Pale Blue Eye. Cross Creek Pictures, Gribsy Productions, Streamline Global Group. Scott Dickerson and C. Robert Cargill, The Black Phone, Bloom House Productions, Crooked Highway, Universal Pictures. The Duffer Brothers, Stranger Things, Episode Season 4, Episode 1, sorry. Chapter one, The Hellfire Club. It's from 21 Laps Entertainment, Monkey Massacre, Netflix, and Upside Down Pictures. Alex Garland, Men, DNA Films. Mia Goth and Ty West for Pearl. A24, Braun Creative, Little Lamb, and the New Zealand Film Commission. I don't have fingernails. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the Stoker Award goes to? Oh, bro. we have a tie. Scott. We Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the first logo award goes to mm -hmm. Scott Dickerson and C. Robert Cargill, The Black Phone, Blumhouse Productions, Crooked Highway, Universal Pictures. And the Duffer Brothers, Stranger Things. Oh my God, Chapter one, The Hellfire Club, 21 Laps Entertainment, Monkey Massacre, Netflix, Upside Down Pictures. Did we blow that? No, I think we made it. I think we made it. I think we made it. All right. Um, so no one's here to accept the award, so the HWA would like to accept in their behalf. Uh, thank you, everyone, and thanks to all the nominees and the people who make great films.
Brian Matthews has asked me to remind you, if you're even thinking about writing a book, <laughs> or a short piece of fiction or a screenplay, you write the speech first, damn it. <laughs> Coming up next is the Superior Achievement in Short Fiction, presented by Al Makatsu and John Langan. Do you have any banter? <laughs> I'm counting on you for the banter. Do we have, uh, well, we've got like good banter, better no, banter. Don't be, no, not they the don't be, they that don't. You said earlier, no. Oh, no, no. That's that was, a real that, thing, was by the way. that was bad banter. That was yeah, bad banter. That was, that I know was... why I got uh, chosen to do the short fiction award. What about you? <laughs> because in some ways, short fiction is the heart of all of this. Isn't it, though? Novels sell, let's make no bones about it. And publishers want novels, and we all imagine that our novel will be made into a film. But short fiction, when you can pull off a good short story that's not just a kind of a gotcha trap story, oh my God, he was a ghost at the end. <laughs> sorry, M. Night, or, <laughs> sorry. Um, but when you can pull off a good job, oh my God, he was insane at the end. <sighs> How many of those? When you can do that, you have achieved something that will last. Right. And that few human beings can achieve. The number of great, great short stories is very small. All things considered in the great scheme of things. The people who are on this list have done an amazing thing already. So amazing that it got them your recognition. And that's something that alone, we always make the cliches about, there are no losers, everybody's a winner. All right? but, but in a sense, this is really true. All of these people have won something by their work, by their persistence, uh, in Aaron Dree's case, by his fabulous hair. <laughs> so let's move ahead with the nominees for superior achievement in short fiction. Aaron Dries in his amazing hair. <laughs> Nona doesn't dance. Cut to care, a collection of little hurts. IFWG Australia, IFWG International. Douglas Gwilym, Poppy's Poppy, Penumbric Speculative Fiction Magazine, Volume 5. I think it's Volume V, but I think it's 5. Number 6. J.A.W. McCarthy, the only thing different will be the body. A woman built by man. Cemetery Gates Media. Anna Taborska, a song for Barnaby Jones, Zagava. And also Anna Taborska, the star, Great British Horror 7. Major Arcane, Black Shuck Books. Mercedes M. Yardley, Fracture, Mother, Tales of Love and Terror, Weird Little Worlds. And the Bram Stoker Award goes to, if I can get it out. You do conceal documents. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying. Mercedes M. Yardley, Fracture, Mother, Tales of Love and Terror, Weird Little Worlds. I was afraid we were going to have another Brian moment. <laughs> Hi guys, I'm Richard Thomas, and Mercedes asked me if I would accept this award, this award for her. So I just wanted to say, first of all, um, I'm pretty sure quite a few of you here know Mercedes. And you know, not only what an amazing author she is, but what a wonderful human being she is. I've um, been lucky to have her as an editor, working with me at Gamut and other projects over the years, and she's just a, a, a joy. So Mercedes, if you're home watching, I hope you are, congratulations. 
Way to go. I'm so proud of you. Love you. You're amazing. <clears throat> and so I just wanted to read her speech real quick. Mercedes says, thank you, my darlings. Love to you all. That's it. Thank you, guys. Little known fact, these envelopes are manufactured by the same people who make the lament configuration. <laughs> Every presenter tonight will be going home with a complimentary Cenobite. You opened it, I didn't. Coming up is the superior achievement in a fiction collection presented by James Chambers and Sarah Tantlinger. Uh, it's an honor to present the Bram Stoker Award for Superior Achievement in a Fiction Collection. Sarah and I were talking earlier today, and I confess that I'm the kind of reader who starts with anthologies to find new writers and then goes out looking for their collections before I start with their novels. So, <laughs> Yes. When you read a short story by an author and then you go on to find a collection and you fall in love with it, it's a really special thing. All the nominees tonight should feel incredibly proud of creating something that they put so much of their heart into. And the nominees for Superior Achievement in a Fiction Collection are Paula D. Ash, We Are Here to Hurt Each Other, Nictating Books. <laughs> R.J. Joseph, Hell Hath No Sorrow Like a Woman Haunted, The Seventh Terrace. Cassandra Cha, Breakable Things, Undertow Publications. Richard Thomas, Spontaneous Human Combustion, Key Light Books. Attila Verez, The Black Maybe, Valencourt Books. And the Bram Stoker Award goes to... Cassandra Kaw, Breakable Things, Undertow Publications. So I am not Cassandra Ka, um, but it is with great delight and joy and pride that I am up here to receive this for them. Um, they are a brilliant writer and a wonderful friend, and they've written a little speech. Uh, so they say, thank you for this honor. I remember being a kid and obsessing over every book marked with a Bram Stoker nominee sticker because I knew that meant they'd all be good. When I started out, all I wanted was a nomination. Now I have two and a win. Please know that wherever I am right now, I am kinda half passed out from shock and delight. It means the world to me to know this little book has made an impact somehow in the sea of luminaries. Thank you. Now up to present Superior Achievement in Anthology, Gwendolyn Keist and Rath James White. Dropping something. I just want to say, like, I love all of the other presenters. They have, they're all so organized. Meanwhile, we ran into each other on an elevator earlier today, and I'm like, hey, I think we might be presenting an award together tonight. And you said something like, yeah, that, that sounds about right. So, and then we went our separate ways. So, you want to just get started? Um, yeah, you know, I have actually fought 250-pound trained athletes in stadiums filled with tens of thousands of people. But every time someone asks me, would you edit an anthology? <laughs> I'm not crazy enough to do that. <laughs> okay, so the nominees are, 
Ellen Datlow, Screams from the Dark, 29 Tales of Monsters and the Monstrous, Tor Nightfire. <laughs> Sadie Hartman and Ashley Sires, Human Monsters, a Horror Anthology, Dark Matter, Inc. Christy Nogle and Willow Becker, Mother, Tales of Love and Terror, Weird Little Books. <laughs> Lindy Ryan, Into the Forest, Tales of the Baba Yaga, Black Spot Books. Sarah Tantlinger, Chromophobia, a Strange House Anthology by Women in Horror, Strange House Books. And the Bram Stoker Award goes to... Ellen Datlow, Screams, Screams from, from the, the Dark, dark 29, 29 Tales of Monsters and the Monstrous. Hi. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I want to congratulate my fellow nominees. Your work was awesome. As a, as a reader for the best horror of the year, believe me, I know. I've read them. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you to all my contributors. Thank you to Kristen Temple um, and to our Nightfire for publishing the book. Without you all, it, would not, it wouldn't exist. And thank you. HWA for the honor. I'm, I really love you all. Thank you. Congratulations, Ellen. Great Grandma Kevin is very proud of you. <laughs> she told me that wasn't me. Uh, Oh, thank you, Grandma. Uh, we are now up to a, a very, I mean, this is all very exciting, but, but this is uh, special for the organization. Here to present uh, the first of three Lifetime Achievement Awards is Lynn Hansen. so honored to have been asked to introduce our first Lifetime Achievement Award winner. The mere mention of her name is enough to bring a smile to your face. So I thought I'd start my introduction by sharing a few things that will make you absolutely hate Elizabeth Massey. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about her very first publication. I'd like to tell you that Elizabeth submitted to a gazillion magazines before she finally found a home for her first story. But I can't. Because Elizabeth Massey sold the very first short story she ever submitted to David B. Silva's a legendary The Horror Show magazine. I'd like to tell you that she struggled after that to get published again. I mean, but I can't because Elizabeth sold her second story to The Horror Show as well. Uh, her first novel, The Sin Eater, Sin Eater that one won the 1992 Bram Stoker Award for Best First Novel. And that was her second Stoker. <laughs> because two years prior, her novelette, Stephen, had won for Best Short Fiction. She beat out Stephen King. <laughs> but you can't hate Elizabeth Massey for her early successes. Because Elizabeth has been doing this since 1984 and full-time since 1993. Uh, wait, like, isn't that kind of another reason to hate Elizabeth Massey? <laughs> getting to quit your day job only nine years after getting your very first short story published? But it's, it's not easy to turn a few early successes into an almost 40-year career in an industry that's constantly evolving in a genre whose popularity has ebbed and flowed repeatedly over the decades. But Elizabeth Massey did it thanks to her dedication, 
amazing talent, and contagious positivity. Elizabeth has written for major publishers and indies alike, including Simon & Schuster, Berkeley, Pocket Books, Harper, Leisure, Pan, Crossroad Press, and, and many more. She's taken on tie-in projects for properties we all know and love, like Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Dark Shadows. She even won the 2009 Scribe Award uh, from the International Association for Media Tie-in Writers for adaptation of The Tudors, Thy Will Be Done. She's written for children and teens, including historicals like The Great Chicago Fire and her Ameriscares series, featuring spooky tales from middle grade readers set in each of the 50 states. Ameriscares was even optioned by Warner Brothers for development into a television series. Her countless short stories have regularly appeared in the best of anthologies, including Year's Best Fantasy and Horror, Best New Horror, and the definitive Best of the Horror Show. But the one thing you'll hear consistently through all of Elizabeth's 18 novels, five collections, and gazillion short stories is her. A ninth generation Virginian who lives in the Shenandoah Valley, her voice and unique perspective are crystal clear in everything she writes. There is joy in the darkness, but often too, a sadness. She excels at intimate stories that bring you close to a world that is foreign and yet somehow eerily familiar. Her world makes you feel empathy for the dark and complex characters she writes about. And that is a gift with a capital G, especially in the times we live in. So please join me in welcoming to the stage the winner of the 2002 Lifetime Achievement Award the incomparable Elizabeth Massey. If you'd told me I was gonna be up here for this a year ago, I'd have said, mm, no. No, 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 it's impossible. But things are possible, it seems like. And when we find something that we are creatively drawn to do, and we take that step and we do it, it's so exciting. And everybody in here who is a writer knows what that feels like when you actually completed your first story or novel. You have no idea what's gonna happen after that. You don't know if you're gonna continue, you hope you will, but you just keep on keeping on. And now that I look back and listen to what Lynn said, whoa, <laughs> I go, oh my gosh, I did a lot of stuff. <laughs> it's, it's, it's surprising how much stuff I did. But I am so incredibly honored to receive this award it, it means such a lot. I mean, it's so incredibly moving to, to get this award. It's something, I, like I said, I didn't think I'd ever, ever get, and why? But all I can say is thank you guys. You guys are amazing. And I love your work. Just keep on doing it. And you may be up here next, you know, next time or in 10, 20, 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> love you all. <laughs> I'd like to take a brief pause here to thank Sarah Reed doing presenting duty up here with me. Uh, for our next Lifetime Achievement Award, please welcome to the stage, Linda Addison. So I am beyond honored to be presenting, not presenting, but introducing the next Lifetime Achievement Award for Nuzo Ono, 
who is a British, Nigerian British writer of Igbo descent. She is a pioneer of the African horror literary genre. Hailed as the queen of African horror, Nuzo's writing showcases both the beauty and the horrific in the African culture within fictitious narratives. Her works have been featured in numerous magazines and anthologies. She has given talks and lectures about African horror, including at the prestigious Miskatonic Institute of Horror Studies in London. Her works have appeared in academic studies and been long listed and short listed for many awards. She holds a law degree and a master's degree in writing, both from Warwick University in England. She is a certified civil funeral celebrant, <laughs> licensed who conduct non-religious burial services. An avid musician, she plays both the guitar and piano, and holds an NVQ in digital music production. She resides in the West Midlands, UK. Miss Ono has stated that her goal in writing and promoting African horror as a bona fide horror genre was to remove the negative stigma against the continent by the popular media using the term African horror. Since searches of other genres like Korean, Japanese, or Scandinavian horror usually brings up results about literary horror works. The Horror Writers Association is honoring Ms. Ono for superior achievement, not just for one book, but for her entire career of work. The Lifetime Achievement Award is presented to an individual whose work has substantially influenced the horror genre. Ms. Ono becomes not only the first black British person to receive it, but also the very first African to do so. She has proven again why Nigeria leads the African continent in the literary and creative industries. Although Ms. Ono has not been able to attend, ASAP Hale will be accepting the Lifetime Achievement Award for Ms. Ono. This will take me just a second. I apologize here. And I just told Ms. As in there, you expect me to follow that? Like, oh my God. Pressure. <laughs> While I'm doing this, has anybody talked about the connection between Parliament and George Romero? No. Oh, this is this is good. <clears throat> so when Parliament was on tour, their bass player not Bootsy at the time, that's a story, uh, thought he could run a roadblock and get a shortcut to Ohio for them. Now, recreational pharmaceuticals may have been involved in this, <laughs> but as George Clinton wrote in his memoirs, all of a sudden he woke up and there's a bunch of weird zombies and monsters and stuff outside the car, and yes, Night of the Living Dead. They had driven onto the set where they were guerrilla filming <laughs> at the time. So I just wanted to bring that up because I've always loved that story. And if you should know who Parliament is, I'm not even going to say that. <clears throat> the second thing I will tell you is Nuzo is a beautiful friend to me, one of my best pen pals in the world, however, comma. She is a master of horror. And in this speech that I'm about to read, 
she invokes one of the most eldritch horrors ever expected, which is audience participation. <laughs> so I am just going to read this straight through, not my voice, which you can tell Nuzo is much better at speaking than I am. Good evenings and blessings of the universe to you all. I'm sorry I can't be here to collect this award in person due to my dilapidating fear of flying and mispronunciation. But the universe knows just how much I would have loved to meet you all in the flesh and thank you for this incredible honor. I mean, is this real life or is this just fantasy? That's not it. Tonight I, Nuzo Ono, have become a Bram Stoker Lifetime Achievement Award recipient. What can I say? This had, not better, this had better not be a case of easy come, easy go. I feel like shouting out in joy to my wonderful mother who went into the light in 2016 on this very day, 17th June. In fact, why not? Mama, I just won a prize. The haunted house is mine. <laughs> I've enlisted with the best, Mama. Oh, oh. I just want to cry. The Bram Stoker Lifetime Award is mine. I'll carry on, carry on. After an exciting and at times very difficult writing journey, being made a recipient of this prestigious award is not just a personal validation of my works, but also a recognition of African horror is a bona fide horror genre. I am thrilled beyond words and thank the Horror Writers Association profoundly for making this possible. African horror is finally emerging from the fringes of the horror genre, and I feel blessed to have played a part in its history. I am truly humbled. I have been judged by my peers and found worthy. As the South Koreans would say, I must have saved a country in my former life. Or in the mortal lyrics of the musical Sound of Music, again, not the one, somewhere in my youth or childhood, I must have done something good. Now, my soul is at peace. If I never win any other award in my lifetime, it would not matter to me because I have won what some people refer to as the Oscars of the horror world. What else can any writer desire? But I know the battle isn't over yet. African horror must continue to fight for its rightful place in the global genre pool. And so in the great tradition of the Oscars, since after all, this is considered the Oscars of the horror world, Please allow me to start thanking everyone and everything, including my late cat, Tinkerbells, and my late goldfish, Sushi. I promise it won't take too long. So here goes my Gresham gratitude. First you, my precious, beautiful haunted house statue. Thank you, I will not let you go. My beautiful mama, Milaku Ono, you, my awesome ancestor, whom I revere and pray for guidance and blessings, you whose fascinating stories in my childhood can you to inspire my works, you whose direct message today has let me know that you are awake, that your eyes are on me. Milaku, your daughter thanks you with her very soul. Thank you, I will not let you go. The entire member of the Hard Writers Association, the Board of Trustees, and the dedicated award committee who found me worthy of this awesome award, thank you, I will not let you go. Here we go. From here, please try to get the audience to sing to the Queen lyrics, will not let you go each time you say thank you, just to stop them from getting bored with the thanks. <laughs> the president of the Horror Writers Association, John Edward Dawson, thank you, I will not let you go. <laughs> I love you, whoever you are. You are a beautiful person. <laughs> Brian Matthews and Megan Arcuri, I, I hope I didn't screw that up, sorry. For the endless emails and hard work to make this a seamless experience for me and my guest, thank you. I will not let you go. There you go. <laughs> my awesome fans who bought, read, reviewed, and supported my writing through the years and brought African horror to where it is today, thank you. I will not let you go. My fierce agent, Bika Van Gellen, again, apologies, who believed in my work at a time when no other agent wanted to touch African horror. Thank you, I will not let you go. My publisher, Dead Sky Publishing, especially Jared Barbie, Jeremy Wagner, and Steve Wands, who saw the beauty of African horror and brought my story to a global audience. Thank you, I will not let you go. My best friend and confidant, Ted Dunphy, and my dear, dear friend, 
ASAP Hale, who is reading this acceptance speech. Raise your hand, ASAP. I'll let you see, Grindel. <laughs> and so many amazing people, too numerous to mention, who supported my work in the early days and up till date. You know yourselves without me mentioning your names. Thank you. I will not let you go. Finally, last but most important, my beloved family, especially my amazing daughters, Candace and Carmen, who are my very existence. I love you both to eternity. Thank you. I will not let you go. My brother Joseph, who paid my hefty university fees when I decided to pursue a master's degree in writing, and my sister Lillian, who is my rock during the breakdown of my two marriages, and has made this special trip to Pittsburgh in my place. She's in amongst you today. I treasure you too. Thank you. I will not let you go. Many, many times through the long and challenging years, when the darkness had threatened to swallow me whole, body and spirit, my family's unwavering love helped me to cling on to life in its endless soul-crushing trials. Thanks to them, the light shines brightly in my life. This award has now added more sparkle to my life. As a great Teddy Pendergrass saying, I am truly blessed. So thank you all once again, each and every one of you inside this hall today. My heart welcomes yours to eternity. I repeat loud and clear, I will not let you go. Thank you. Oh, can you take my glasses? That would have been a quick trip to the emergency room. Our third and final Lifetime Achievement Award winner uh, is John Saul. To uh, introduce the award, please welcome to the stage Kevin Wetmore. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. To the horror family, John Saul needs no introduction, so I will give him a needlessly long one. <laughs> Saul published Suffer the Children in 1976, just two years after Stephen King's Carrie took the world. But Suffer the Children was the first paperback original to make it onto the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, since then, John has written 36 more novels, all of which landed on the New York Times bestseller list. John began writing in seventh grade, plays, poetry, short stories, and was encouraged by a teacher to do so. However, after Suffer the Children, the floodgates opened. Punish the Sinners, Comes the Blind Fury, The God Project, Nathaniel, Hellfire Creature, The Blackstone Chronicles, The Right Hand of Evil, The Manhattan Club, Hunt Club, and dozens of others. Uh, one of the nominators described Saul as, quote, a Gen X gateway drug to a world of horror. That one read John's stuff and it led you to other things. You treasured him, but you treasured what he introduced you to. And I think that is certainly a tribute to, to the man in his writing. Several of his novels have been made into films and TV movies. Uh, and he was also out and proud long before uh, such a thing had been socially acceptable. He is now with his husband of 47 years, Michael Sack. The HWA is proud to name John Saul a Lifetime Achievement Award winner. Here to accept the award on behalf of John uh, is Kevin Wedmore. <laughs> Thank, no, stop. It's, uh, uh, John also uploaded a video on Vimeo that I believe we will be making public uh, later uh, so you can see the actual thing itself, but he sent this. Wow, this is certainly a great and unexpected honor. Having been retired for more than a decade now, it's very nice to know that I haven't been forgotten. In the words of Ruth Gordon, upon receiving her first Oscar at the age of 72, I can't tell you how encouraging a thing like this is. <laughs> to all of you who have supported me all these years, thank you. I only wish I could be here to thank you in person, but unfortunately at 81, travel isn't as simple as it once was. I am, however, with you in spirit and intend to give each and every one of you nightmares tonight. I also want to thank a few people who have been important in both my career and my life. First, Jane Rotrosen, who took me on as a client when I was sure I could make a career writing comedy murder mysteries. Second, Linda Gray, who took a big gamble back in 1977 and became first my editor, then my friend and editor, and finally my friend, editor, and publisher. Last and most importantly, my husband of 47 years, Michael Sack, who not only believed in me, but helped me create nearly everything I've written since that day I met him. 
Thanks again to them and to all of you, and have a wonderful evening. So, John, if you're watching, congratulations. <clears throat> Here to present the President's Award is the President of HWA, John Edward Lawson. So thank you, Kevin. All right. And thank you, everyone who was here tonight. Um, I'd like to say it is an absolute honor, uh, not just to serve the general community, but it's an honor because for the past seven months, I've been getting to know how things work behind the scenes in the HWA, who makes up the backbone of the HWA, the volunteers, the people running the committees, the people who answer emails, the people who post things on social media, the folks who are volunteers putting in 20, 30, even more hours uh, sometimes uh, at the top level of the Board of Trustees. Um, all the folks who made this happen here in, on the ground in Pittsburgh working around the clock for the last year or more. Um, so, one thing that came up as I was sort of learning the organization, sort of coming in as a relative outsider, uh, not having actually volunteered in the HWA prior to saying, oh, I could probably be president. I, <laughs> that doesn't sound so hard. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> I'm just saying. <clears throat> uh, but there has been one person who uh, every corner I looked into in the HWA, um, they were ubiquitous. And um, it struck me that every single person within the HWA was only seeing the sort of the one corner of the iceberg that was uh, just sort of pacing towards them at the time. But uh, I just sent myself an email to actually you know, get all this list of things right. There was no way I was gonna remember all this. But they were um, coordinating the scholarship process. They were spearheading our new international interview series. They were representing us monthly on all the Disney must pay task force calls. Uh, they were central to the chapter's handbook revision uh, over the past two years. Uh, they were providing regular guidance to our volunteer coordinator and to our uh, social media team. Um, they were courting Women in Horror Month. They were advising the president um, and the president before me, Mr. John Palisano. Um, and they were also chairing the Publications Committee and coordinating the Horror Poetry Showcase every year and also our various professional anthologies and also single-handedly putting together every single month the Quick Bites newsletter, which I don't know if you realize this, but if you were to print that out, because I've gone in and proofread some of these past few months, it's like 70 or 80 pages every single month. And some of us who have had chat books, like, we couldn't do that every single month, come on. So, <laughs> and so much more that happens behind the scenes because Megan is that kind of person who will always fill in the gap and make sure that this community is lifted up no matter what happens. Um, so as president, I've been trying to live up to the vice president and the example that they've been setting here behind the scenes. So please, everyone, welcome Megan Harcurry. I really appreciate it. 
a lot shorter than the president. <laughs> I'm really honored to be chosen for this award. Um, although I am missing my husband's birthday, Father's Day, and celebrating my 20th anniversary with him, so maybe I shouldn't be getting it after all. <laughs> Happy birthday, Kev. Love you. <laughs> um, as the vice president, I've kind of been a jack of all trades, working with many different departments, tackling many different issues. But what it's done is it's given me a broad view of the HWA and a great, great appreciation for the hard work all of our volunteers do every single day. Those volunteers include my fellow board members. Leading isn't always easy. Sometimes I think people think we're off in a closed room somewhere, arbitrarily making decisions without thought to the consequences. And when I started on the board, every time I commented on our forum, I kind of felt like Zod in those circles with Marlon Brando, and these big heads would be looking down at me going, guilty, guilty, guilty. But after I got my sea legs, I realized it really wasn't at all like that. And in fact, this current board is one of the best groups of people I have ever worked with. First and foremost, they are thoughtful and they are kind. Many types of issues come before us. Sometimes they are difficult to navigate, but I can guarantee you that each decision is made with careful consideration and good intentions. At the end of the day, I'm glad these people are on my team, our team, and they include Gabino Iglesias, who brings a welcome frankness to our conversations. Lisa Kroger also brings a positivity and encouragement. Angela Eureka Smith lightens the mood with her wonderful sense of humor while taking our work seriously and often coming up with super creative solutions to issues. Ellen Dat Lowe <laughs> is full of wisdom and knowledge and is able to cut through the bullshit like anybody I know. <laughs> In addition to her vast experience and wealth of knowledge, Linda Addison brings to the board the same warm, loving energy she brings with her everywhere else she goes. We should write songs about Brian Matthews' level-headedness and dry wit, <laughs> both always welcome in any discussion, and the guy has a heart of gold. I always tease Jim Chambers about this, but I swear that in order to do the many, many, many things he does for the organization, horror university, membership, juries, chapters, anything, you name it, he must know how to bend time. And he always does it with a smile. I'll have what he's having. <laughs> Max Gold is our self-proclaimed -pro dragon. As our treasurer, he's always keeping an eye on our financial situation. Sometimes he has the unenviable task of saying no or not right now, but he is strong, he is true, and he's always thinking about ways to make things better. I don't know, this, know if you know this about our secretary, Becky Spratford, but she has a PhD in GSD, getting shit done. <laughs> if you want something done, just ask Becky. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, I would be remiss if I did not talk about both John Palisano and John Lawson. I had visions of looking over them tonight with my hand over my heart saying, my two Johns. <laughs> but as soon as the words took form, I realized that might be better at a different kind of convention. <laughs> my two Johns, though, are different in many ways, but they are, they are similar in the important ones. They are smart, they have giant hearts, and they work their asses off to serve this organization. It has been my pleasure to work with them and this board, as well as the myriad volunteers I have encountered. And it has been a pleasure to serve as a vice president of this wonderful organization. Thank you. As we begin to close in on the last two awards, Brian Matthews has asked me to stop making this joke. <laughs> but you know. <laughs> to give the Superior Achievement in Long Fiction Award, please and, uh, welcome to the stage Cynthia Palaio and Jeff Strand.
So I was the previous winner in this category, which means that 45 seconds from now, I'll be last year's news. <laughs> That's fine. I'm okay with it. You know, I've always said that continued relevance is overrated. The nominees for Superior... Actually, you know what? Um, could we postpone just a bit? I've written some um, award-delaying shtick. So I'd just like you to <clears throat> the script. Hi, Jeff. Hi, StokerCon 2023 guest of honor, Cynthia Palayo, also a recent winner. I'm glad you're here. I need you to help me hide a body. I beg your pardon? You know the luxury suite where all the guests of honor hang out? The one with the hot tub and the masseuse, the one where we can step away from the common people for a while? No, I do not. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, so it got crazy. Mistakes were made, I've taken a human life, and I need a fixer. I got the blood out of my dress, but there's still a dead body to make disappear. Are you in? Because if you're not in, you know too much, and don't make me kill you. It would be a shame to lose you and Gabino in the same evening. <laughs> stares blankly. The urge to kill has been with me ever since I was a little girl, but I think we should just give out the award now. No, just eight more pages. Eight more pages? Okay. <laughs> the nominees for Superior Achievement in Long Fiction are Rebecca J. Alred and Gordon B. White, and in her smile, the world, Trepidatio Publishing. Krista, Krista Carmen, Through the Looking Glass and Straight into Hell, Orphans of Bliss, Tales of Addiction Horror, Wicked Run Press. <laughs> Laurel Hightower, Below, Ghoulish Books. Alma Katsu, The Werewolf, Amazon Original Stories. <laughs> E.V. Knight, Three Days in the Pink Tower, Creature Publishing. <laughs> and the Bram Stoker Award goes to Alma Katsu, <laughs> The Werewolf, Amazon Original Stories. First thing I have to say is, sorry, Brian, I forgot to write a speech. <laughs> I don't know where my head was. Um, I'd like to thank HWA, the board, all the voting members, everyone in this room, of course, the other nominees, because there's so many great works that, that were nominated this year. Um, I need to thank Gracie Doyle, who's my editor at Amazon and she's wonderful to work with, and all the team at Amazon. Uh, my agent, um, whose name just went right out of my head. <laughs> Richard Pine, that's it. And, and Eliza Rothstein, and um, my film agent, Angela Chang Kaplan, because she'll hold it against me if I don't say that. And, um, and really, HWA, it is just the most wonderful organization. There's not one person that I've met in my years with HWA who hasn't just welcomed me, you know, as a friend right off the bat. You're wonderful people, and thank you so much. Well, if this is the Oscars of horror, it's time for the best picture. Superior achievement in a novel will be presented by Al Goingback and Jewel Gomez.
I, I just want to make a personal statement first. I got the Lifetime Achievement Award and I wasn't able to uh, say thank you in person a couple of years ago. And so I want to say thank you to the board and to everyone for that award, uh, Lifetime Achievement Award, no, and I'm going to try to stop live it, up to it. it. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> Notice how I was cleverly opening? <laughs> stop <laughs> thank it. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, but thank you all very much and for being so welcoming. So. Well, we're, supposed, we're the last presenters tonight. Yeah. We're supposed to be more entertaining than everybody came yeah. before us. It's not going to happen. <laughs> The bar's open, we've got one award left, and there's still five very nervous people. Mm. And I've been threatened, if I don't hurry up and give the last award, that somebody's gonna rush the stage, and Alma scares the hell out of me. <laughs> so tonight, for the nominees for Superior Achievement in the Novel are, I'll let you go first. Gabino Iglesias, The Devil Takes You Home, Mulholland Press. I'm trying to read with my uh, wife's glasses. I forgot mine. And uh, English is not my first language. American is, so if I slur the words, you understand. <laughs> so, Alma Katsu, The Fervor, G.P. Putnam's Sons. Gwendolyn Keist, Reluctant Immortals, Saga Press. Josh Mallerman, Daphne Del Rey. Katriana, Katriona Ward, Sundial, Tour Nightfire. I opened it for you, sir. So. Okay. I'll let you read it. And the Bram Stoker Award goes to. Gabino Iglesias, The Devil Takes You Home, Mulholland Press. You're giving that. Yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations. I said, what? Uh, I'm the last one. Sit down. This is going to last. Um, wait, let me perform. I was leaving the room, and I was about to grab my wallet, and I remembered Brian telling me twice to write a speech. <laughs> and I said, I'm not going to, because there's no way I'm going to win. But uh, right next to the wallet on my nightstand was, you know, they leave the pen and the thing. And I said, if I grab a piece of paper <laughs> from that, and I just write like three names that I would thank if I thought I had a chance to win. I can pull it off, and it seems like I wrote a speech, and then Brian won't get mad at me. <laughs> so it's a piece of paper with two, three names on it. So uh, we're going to do that. Um, <laughs> uh, let's do the thank yous first, because those are always awesome, and you're always afraid that you're going to um, forget people. So I want to thank um, Melissa Danasco, my wonderful agent, who is intelligent and educated and eloquent and very organized and all the things that I am not. Um, and she made this happen with the second person that I want to thank, my editor at Mulholland, Josh Kendall. Um, those names are in here. Um, and then I have random names. For example, the next one on this list is Becky Spratford, uh, because I think we don't thank her enough and the amount of stuff that she does for the genre in general is absolutely amazing. <laughs> and at that point, I just started having fun. Uh, I, I knew I wasn't going to win, so I wrote down John Edward Lawson because a couple years ago we were doing an event uh, in Baltimore, and it was dark, and it was a weird night in Baltimore. And <laughs> we were talking about publishing, and I kind of... You know, I said something that might have felt like I was calling him old. I said, like, when I started reading Bizarro, you were already in the game, man. <laughs> and he looked me dead in the, he looked down at me, because he looks down at everybody. And he said, Gabino, this is a fucking war of attrition. <laughs> and that's the most succinct, 
perfect example of what publishing is like. So thank you, John. We're still fighting. Um, <laughs> I want to thank the HWA, obviously, everyone who read it and, and voted. I want to thank all the booksellers. You folks are amazing. I want to thank all the librarians. Uh, to the, the, yes. Um, without librarians, um, none of us would be here. Uh, and uh, to those of you watching at home, they're, they're, I've met almost everyone here. You're all awesome, so this is not directed at you. But we, we have a Raph. We have a Joe Lansdale. When you mess with librarians, you mess with all of us. So don't. Um, <laughs> And now that I mentioned Joe, I think from now on we should start a thing where if you get a stoker, you stand up here and you say, thank you, Karen. Yeah. Now and forever. Um, and because I don't want to get murdered, thank you to Alma Katsu. Uh, <laughs> When this thing was about to be published, I came begging on my knees for a blurb, and she read it, and she gave me a blurb, and that wasn't enough. She said, that's actually kind of like a good book. It's going to do well. And then I went, she's saying that because she's nice. And now that I have a stoker, I know she went to her black phone, and she called people <laughs> at a bunch of three-letter agencies and stuff happened. Uh, suddenly, Stephen Graham Jones doesn't have a book this year. Um, come on. So thank you, Alma. <laughs> um, uh, and the, the last name on the list is uh, Ryan, Brian, Brian Keene, uh, who's been there since I didn't know what I was, I'm, I still don't know what I'm doing, but from the early days he was there uh, being encouraging and uh, to me, folks like, like Cynthia, um, he gave us a lot early on and he continues to give us, uh, it's not like he's editing my work, but he's, um, he tells us how to handle bad people. Uh, for that we call him Batman and uh, consider him a mentor. Um, which takes me to, um, Y'all thought giving me a microphone was a good idea. Um, recent uh, stuff that, you know, if you have this program, take a good look at it. There's a whole bunch of women of color in here. There's a bunch of queer writers in here. There's a bunch of black and brown and Asian and non-binary folks on this list. And that makes a lot of people angry. And that makes a lot of racists uncomfortable. But they're also people. Racists also have feelings. So, <clears throat> to them, I want to say, this is the future. Stay salty, motherfuckers. <laughs> Thank you. I love you all. One more thing. One more thing. I am. Um, Super stoked, see what I did there that I won? And I am super stoked that I am not the first Puerto Rican to get a stoker. Stand up. And last but not least, Brian, who is, is this you doing this? Who is announcing it? No, uh, current concert. Current. Oh, so let's bring Michael, Ben, and Sarah up here to tell us where we're going to be next year. So the hint is zebras at beaches. Okay, well first of all, I just want to say three of our guests of honor just won stokers. So can we give a round of applause for that?
And for our second hint, um, is Casey Griffin here? She Hello. is. Could she come up, please? Please. <laughs> Uh, before we uh, pass the torch, is that what we're doing? Uh, to San Diego, the next city for StokerCon. I, I just wanted to say on behalf of these guys and in the future tense of you, uh, thank you all. We will not let you go. <laughs> Casey Griffin. Thank you. Uh, let's give another hand to Sarah, Ben, and Mike for an amazing job. <laughs> they are but big shoes to fill, but we will try our best. Um, so the dates are May 30th, June 2nd, and there's some QR codes around so you can scan and register already. The location is the lovely Marriott Mission Valley. And uh, my local co-chairs couldn't be here today, but they are Dennis K. Crosby, Sarah Faxon, and Teresa Halverin. And we have a great crew uh, and lots more people you'll get to know. Um, we're also excited to share three of the confirmed guests of honor. They are Paula Guren, Paul Tremblay, and San Diego's own Jonathan Mayberry. And I believe there's a special registration discount for the next three days, um, the Pittsburgh special. So make sure to scan the QR codes and register. And more to come. Hope to see all of your lovely faces next year. We have uh, one last bit of business uh, before we close today. I would like to remind everyone, write the speech. <laughs> and also a safety warning, please avoid eye contact or sudden movements around Al Makatsu. She just won an award. <laughs> we cannot be responsible for your safety. The final thing we're doing tonight is the closing remarks from our president and vice president who I would like to summon to the stage, uh, Jonathan Edward Lawson and Megan R. Curry as they're coming up. I would just like to thank all of you and thank our host from Pittsburgh for allowing me to uh, come up and have some fun with you tonight. Uh, so thank you for being such a great audience. It's been a lot of fun. Your great, great grandmothers love you all. Congratulations and good night. Yeah, so I just want to say uh, on behalf of the organization, um, thank you so much for um, being such great uh, attendees and such a great community here. Um, it's been like nothing else here on the ground in Pittsburgh this year. Um, it's been amazing, and we are really excited to work with the San Diego team next year. Um, we have some exciting things to announce for that. Uh, so please do uh, take advantage of the QR codes here. Um, it is a special discount for the folks here on the ground in Pittsburgh. Um, this is not our usual uh, mode of operation to uh, launch the tickets so soon, um, but as you might have heard, uh, costs, not just inflation, but just hotel costs and convention costs are skyrocketing. And also to avoid conflicts with other conventions, we're planning way ahead now so we can make sure that we uh, continue to provide, well, I don't know if we can top Pittsburgh, but uh, we're going to try and come close. <laughs> we want to try and keep up the standard that they've set uh, and that we've come to expect uh, all the way from Denver going back to Las Vegas on the Queen Mary, if you were there, that was incredible. Um, and we hope to make more memories with you next year. Um, so I would also like to thank our sponsors once again, our vendors, our guests of honor, and all of the volunteers who are with us here this weekend. Thank you.
Okay, so I think, uh, do we still have the cash bar open back there? <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, so everyone, uh, enjoy yourselves.